or Steve, my partner, will tell people, yep, have you ever slept in Pablo Escobar's bed? And everybody starts, you know, they think it's a, uh, you know, but it is true because I, I slept one night in his bed because they, the police uh, bet me that I would not do it. I say, yeah, I'll do it, you know. But you Wait, know, wait, you were there actually for a full night? And, like you could have yeah, stayed anywhere else? Yeah, for a full night. I, obviously, I changed the sheets, but I, I could <laughs> not sleep. Welcome back to another episode of the Board with Nelly podcast. Today, I'm joined by Javier Pena, who is a retired DEA agent uh, who led one of who was one of the lead investigators in the manhunt for Colombian drug lord and leader of the Medellin cartel, Pablo Escobar. He's also the author of Manhunters, How We Took Down Pablo Escobar, which can be purchased on DEA Narcos. Javier and his partner Steve also do worldwide um, keynote speaking uh, and have been doing it for seven, eight years now. Um, and they've done over 75 appearances uh, in a year, which I mean, I'm, I'm just leading, reading the list of things you guys are doing. Are you busier now than when you were hunting the most dangerous man on the planet? Well, you know what? Uh, when the Netflix show came out on on Pablo Escobar, that's when our speaking and we weren't uh, doing anything. But after the show came out, people were contacting us. Hey, can you talk about the real story? And we had created a, uh, Steve and I, a uh, sort of an outline a uh, with pictures, photos. Basically, it was the rise and fall of Pablo Escobar. So once the Netflix came out, it's like we were in demand. We were went all over the world, uh, Australia, Europe, doing our our presentation and uh it it was great very busy but then obviously the the pandemic hit and it you know obviously everything stopped and after the pandemic uh we've been i don't know we do about 10 10 a year which is good you know I'm, still I'm, pretty uh, good yeah yeah getting ready i'm you know i'm retired so it's my part-time job but it's fun but i'm glad it slowed down it was, it was <laughs> I didn't hit me there for a while. I was going to say, how is the the rush of your you know prior career to this other career now that you have because of your first career? Yeah, because of my uh, and like I said with uh, DEA, I, I came on and I did uh, thirty years with them, and it's it's kind of ironic because uh, I did not know when I applied. I did not even know what DEA was. <laughs> you know, I had to ask around. It was just a, it was a federal government or paying a little bit more. I was working as a police in Laredo, Texas, you know, right. making, I think, uh, 1977 as a police officer. Sheriff, it really was with the sheriff's office, but making $10,000 a year. And then, uh, when I got my degree, you know, that's when uh, I noticed that DEA was hiring, and I did not know who they, what DEA meant. Or so I asked them, well, they were they were paying like twenty one thousand. So I came on, and I just wanted to say, you know what? I'm just going to do a couple of years with DEA, go back work with the sheriff's office in Laredo, and uh, you know, I came on in 1984. Those that two years turned into thirty years. So uh, I, I liked it, you know, and I, obviously, you know, it's. Uh, it was a great career, had fun, had a lot of bad times too, uh, saw a lot of things, and uh, that's why uh, here I here we are right now talking about it. When you were saying like you how you were underpaid or getting paid very little, that stuff mattered to you at the time, or did you just really enjoy what you were doing? You know what? I enjoyed what I was doing because I was young. I was, I think when I came on with the sheriff's office, I was 18 years old. I was living with my grandparents in Laredo, Texas, had it made. My uh, grandmother, my abuelita, cooked for me, best uh, food around. And I was, you know, I mean, I was having fun. I, you know, the money was, at, your, at that age, you're, you're working, you're having fun. And uh, I was going to school at, at, during the day, college. So I would work the night shift, get off in the morning, go to college, come back uh, around 12 noon, sleep, you know. And it was, now that's tough. That is tough. And I know there's people out there, listeners who have done that, right? You know, where they work at night, you go to college during the day, and that is just tough. But I did it, got my degree, and I just, I wanted to get out of Laredo too. I wanted to go see basically what, what other agency so uh and uh, i was applying with bigger police departments 
And I remember one of the DEA agents says, hey, Javier, if you come out with DEA, you're going to see the world. And you know what? He was right. You know, So I think I made the right decision. Is there the sense of, you know, you're, you know, a very small fish in a big pond kind of, and you're constantly looking for the next big thing? Do you have that rush that like, okay, we've, we've caught a guy with whatever, let's say 10 grams of Coke, and then we moved into another guy who's got one ounce. And then like, we want to get the guy that's shipping 500 ounces or 500 kilos or whatever. Right, right. That, that, that is correct. I mean, in, in my career, uh, I started with DEA. My first assignment was in Austin, Texas. And uh, Austin at that time was the music capital of the world. It was fun to live there. And uh, But I was doing small cases, like you said, you know, ounces, you know, ounce of heroin, ounce of cocaine. Uh, methamphetamine was big during this time in, uh, uh, in, in central Texas, in Austin, a lot of meth labs. But it was we were dealing with smaller crooks, smaller traffickers, and, and you know what? And, and DEA is you know we don't we don't get, go after the small guy. We go after the biggest and the baddest, you know, and uh, we uh, try to get to the top of an organization. And so I was like, well, you know, I've always wanted to go see how the big traffickers <laughs> work. So that's why I applied. And I applied for Mexico. I did not apply for Colombia. And, uh, yeah, it, it was a mistake. And because I remember my boss comes in and says, Javier, did you put in for Colombia? Did you apply to go to Colombia? I said, no, sir. He said, I said, I applied to go to Mexico. And he says, well, <laughs> you know what? They, <laughs> they're sending you to Colombia. And he said, you can fight it. You can get out of it because you never put in for it. I said, nah. It's the paperwork's done. I'll just go to Colombia. Let me go see on the map. I don't even know where Colombia was at that time. So uh, that's how. But were I, you aware of the magnitude of that decision and, and the guy you were going after? No, no, not at all. And, and really? You know what? Yeah, no, no, nothing. I mean, I just wanted to see. I knew that, you know, we didn't deal with Colombians in Texas. We dealt with Mexicans. A lot of, uh, you know, and, and it was the smaller crooks. I mean, you always, in DEA, you always try to shoot for that bigger crook. You always try to get the top of the totem pole, right? That's the way the organization works. So uh, when I ended up in Colombia, I had heard of Pablo Escobar, but I had not really heard that much. I mean, I knew he was a big trafficker, but that's all I was. What so, year was that in when, so when you got there? Colombia in 1988. Oh, okay. So I, All I right. got hired on in DEA 1984, and I, I get to Columbia in I, er, early 1988. It was like January, February, and uh, I was there about a month trying, you know, get settled in, and and you know, and it's not like, well, I'm going to work on this guy, you know. Now you're, you know, anyway. So my boss comes in and says, "Hey, Javier, we're uh, signing you the Pablo Escobar investigation," and there's a senior agent. She was there at the time. She had the lead on it. She needed a partner. I think her partner had left. So they said, you're going to help her out. Okay, yeah, sure, boss, no problem. So I started helping her. And she was in the process. Uh, she fell in love with another guy in the embassy. So she wanted. She was leaving. So her her mind was not into it. Her mind was on something <laughs> else. She was getting ready to leave and get married. So I started taking over, started meeting our our, our cops, the guys we were uh, working with on Pablo Escobar, and that's how I ended up, uh, you know, uh, you know, searching for Pablo Escobar. Right. So you got there quite a few years before Steve, then. Right. Right. Steve gets there in 1991. And I get there in uh, 1988. Yes. Wow. Okay. So yeah, yeah, and and you know what, uh, you know, so I just real quick. I mean, I I got to see some of the most violent, uh, drastic, some of the most violent, barbaric, uh, you know, things that Pablo Escobar was doing because that's basically Pablo Escobar. I just mentioned, you know, he he. he he came onto the radar basically I mean, 87, 88, when he started, you know, when uh, uh, the uh, terrorism really geared up. That's when we started really heavy. We knew he was a trafficker. We did not know he was that big, basically. 
So uh, I got to experience you know, the famous, you know, the deadly, you know, Avianca bombing, the presidential candidate, the DOS building bombing, the killing of... DOS building bombing is a, a government building, right? Right, yeah. The DOS was the... It's like the local FBI slash immigration office in Colombia. It wow. doesn't Imagine exist. someone did that in the States... Yeah, that's I mean, in, that's, it, it was, you yeah, can't I think mean, about imagine it. Imagine in the states if you blew up a, a government building, you know. Uh, so it, it, that's when people started actually like, who is this guy? What's this guy all about? You know, who is Pablo Escobar? And that's when we started finding out that he was just a, 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 a narco trafficker, and we call him the inventor of terrorism. Because, you know, we had never seen a, a trafficker put, you know, car bombs, killing police officers, blowing up buildings, airlines, you know. So it, he was a different type of a trafficker. Different kind of, he was a narco-terrorist, yeah. Uh, let me ask you this question. In the show, you're kind of depicted as a guy that will do some of the dirtier things to get the end result, which is usually catching a bad guy. How much of that is fiction and how much of that is, is not? Well, you know what? That, and that's the, I get asked that question a lot. In fact, sometimes like in Europe, when we do shows, it's like, sir, uh, we know you were a dirty agent. How did you, you know, the way I say, you know what? If I had been a dirty agent, I'd be getting out of prison right about now. And, uh, you know, I tell people I got promoted to the highest ranks of DEA, which is called Senior Executive Service position, which is the highest rank. So anyway, I, I uh, but I get that question a lot. And it's artistic licenses. Now, th- my character in the show, you know, I was single in Colombia. You know, I, I was, you know, I mean, I tell people, I, you know, I had girlfriends. I dated. Uh, I didn't date communists. I didn't date informants. I didn't, you know, but, you know, I, I was single. And well, you were doing well. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I was doing well. Yeah. And, and because I spoke Spanish, you know, fluently. So in, in the police, and I have to tell you that when I get to Colombia, we started working with a specialized group of police officers. And they were from the, the, the section was called the Hing. Dirección Judicial Investigación. Anyway, so I got to be friends with those guys because they, you know, I, I go where the day to their office, working other cases. Then when the Pablo Escobar Task Force really set up, when it got established, in the beginning, in when I was there in 88, I would only go two or three times a week to Medellin, and it's the cops who I already knew. So they knew me. We trusted each other, which was very important. And uh, that's how we, we ended up getting close. And then, you know, like I said, a couple of my police officer friends were killed by Pablo Escobar. So that makes that bond us even tighter. Uh, so so I, I, I knew these guys. They trusted me. I trusted them. But I would do two or three days. What I'm trying to say is because the second search, when Steve shows up, after Pablo Escobar escapes from his luxury prison, is when we formalized the task force. And that's when Colombia asks us if we can help him. So we are now living at the famous... Bloque de Búsqueda, which is a search block in Medellín. So we're, we have our own room there. We're living with the police. We're there 24 hours a day. It, that made the difference. And that's what Steve and I basically hook up during that second search. So the first search, in, you know, and if I can say, I mean, you know, it, it was, it, it, and before we get any further, I just want to tell, you know, your listeners that, hey, the real heroes were the Colombian National Police. The search block, Bloque de Búsqueda, led by Colonel Hugo Martinez, uh, led by General uh, Octavio Vargas Silva. He was the architect of the search block. They never get the credit, so I always right. point out they're okay. the hero, not not anybody else. They should they deserve the credit. They lost a lot of police officers. Well, you know the civilians, not even you know just talking about all the civilians that Pablo Escobar killed. So it was a very, it was a bloody, bloody uh, search. Uh, it, that's why Pablo Escobar, narco, we call him the inventor of narco-terrorism. 
And, uh, you know, like I told you before, I got to see a lot of the tragedies, a lot of the barbaric uh, stuff that, that he was doing. So it's, and this is personal for me because, uh, yeah, the, my friends that were killed. Let me ask you this question maybe a different way. Would you understand if one of your compatriots in Colombia did act in a way that was maybe not the most, let's say, official way to act after the death of a family member, after the death of a partner, after the death of someone they cared about? Because I would imagine it'd be very difficult to, you know, they've lost hundreds and thousands of people to maintain your cool and, and continue to play the game the the way you know the rules state it should be played, yeah, and, and you know what that, that's a great question, and uh, and first of all, and I'm, I'll talk a little bit about more, but you know, like we tell people, we broke rules, we broke policies, but we never broke the law. All right, what I mean about that is, yeah, we we did a lot of stuff. Uh, going out with the police where we shouldn't have. I got involved. I had to arrest one of the traffickers because the informant, uh, anyway, only trusted me. So I had, you know, and I don't have any authority in Colombia. But, you know, uh, that's the type of stuff. And I always remember, you know what, when, when we get there, I remember Colonel Martinez, a real hero, the leader of our search blog, told me, he says, Javier, he says, we're not here to uh, seize money. He says, we're not here to seize dope. We're here to kill Pablo Escobar. So their focus was on killing Pablo Escobar. Why? Because of all the police that he killed, because of all the way Pablo Escobar was. And in fact, uh, Pablo Escobar would send letters to Colonel Lugo Martinez say, hey, I'm going to kill your family. I know where they are. So Colonel Martinez had to be hiding his family. So it was a personal war uh, between them. And uh, like I said, that's why uh, we I never saw like, you know, hey, taking him out, shooting a guy. And you know what? You know, on you know, a defensive guy. I've never none of that ever happened. You know, that's a lot of it is you know the Hollywood Hollywood, uh, yeah, right. But you know what I did see is that whenever you go after, especially those sicarios, and you know what, the life of a sicario. There's been documentaries, movies, but it's never been done right. You know what I'm saying? It's an interesting phenomena. Whenever you would go and, and raid a house, 95% there was going to be a shootout. <laughs> you know, it was. It wow, was, really? Yeah, 95%. Get ready. People had guns. You know, they weren't giving up. They they come out uh, shooting. And I, I remember one of the Sicarios I had to arrest. And, you know, and I told it. And, you know, uh, because the informant. Call me, and I remember the informant said, "It's only, I'll only deal with you, Mr. Pena, nobody else." So, but you know, uh, the informant said, "Hey, this trafficker, and he was a vicious, vicious guy, is at a nightclub in Medellin, and I'm looking at him, and uh, if you want him, he, he is here, but only you." So, you know, I had to, you know, told my police officer, you know, the the search block. So we went about ten officers to the bar and I met the informant. They told me, all right, he's over there, the guy's resting. And he was a known Sicario. I think he had already killed about 20 people. So <laughs> I arrested him and obviously he fought, pulled out a gun. Luckily, no no shots were fired. My backup came in, we arrested him. However- He pulled the gun on you, but he, you he didn't shoot? Yeah, yeah, we, I, we were able to fight. We were wow. able to fight. You know, then to the ground. Oh, yeah, it was like one of the most. That's a movie things. scene, right? That's, that's actually, a, that's, movie, that's real. Yeah that, really happened. yeah, that really happened. And my guys came in. I was, they jumped on him. And you know what? There was a lot of people in the club. And everybody was, it was like a disc, discotheque. Everybody was dancing, having a good time. So they saw the commotion. Everybody started running. And, you know, but no shots were fired. But anyway, so we take him back to our base. And, uh, the guy decides to talk. I was very surprised, you know, 
the first thing that surprised me was he was 15 years old. Can you imagine? Wow. 15 year old wow. Sicario already killed 20, 30 people. Wow. One of the bars, most trusted men. Yep, 15 years old. And then, wow, it was that I will, that interview I will never forgive. I mean, I'll never, well, forgive. I know. Never forget, I'll never forget, forget. Yeah. Both. Yeah. Both. Yeah. I'll never forget that interview. He says, you know what? He says, uh, I love Pablo Escobar. He's my hero. He said, he saved my life. He saved my mother's life. We were living in a cardboard box on the side of the street. He saw us. He stopped. Uh, and, you know, he, he told us where to live, bought us a house, gave us money. The only condition was that, hey, you're going to be working for me now. And, you know, this, I call him a kid. He was a Sicario, 15 years old. Says, uh, you know what? My life is dedicated to Pablo Escobar because he saved my mother's life. We were going to die. We were didn't have any money, didn't have any food. So now I have a house. She has money. She's got a kitchen. Uh, he said, so my, I owe my life to Pablo Escobar. He said, I'll be dead by 22, 23 years old. I'm not going to make it out of the barrios of Medellin. He says, so I owe my life to him, and I work for him, and I do whatever he tells me. He says, uh, and by the way, you know that because uh, a lot of police officers were getting killed by sicarios because it was the war Pablo Escobar created. And Pablo Escobar's orders were kill as many police officers as you can, and I will compensate you. He said, at the end of the day, I get $100 a head for the killing of any police officer. Can you imagine $100 for a human life? And this Sicari explained to me, he says, yep, they're walking a beat. He says, and, and it was uniformed police officers because, you know, they're plain clothes. They did not know who they are, but uniformed police says, I walk behind them, take out my gun. I shoot them in the back of the head. They never know what hit them. They fall. He said, at the end of the day, I get a hundred dollars, man, you know, for, for, you know, and he told me, he said, one day I killed three. He said, like, no big deal. I made 300 bucks. And then he says, you know what? I get the money. Most of it goes to my mother and I'll never forget why, but he said the rest of the money, if I can't, if I have, you know, leftover, I buy beer, I buy a nice pair of tennis shoes, a nice pair of jeans. He said, that's, that's what I my goals in life, but already again admitted to ten police officers that he had killed for Pablo Escobar. So, how do you fight that? How do you? Fight? So I was going to ask you. That's my next question, I guess. Yeah. How How do you feel after that conversation? You feel completely depleted, and the enemy is yes. just so wide and evil that it can't be stopped, right? Yes, and also if you do the math. Pablo Escobar had about 500 sicarios working for him. And if you multiply that attitude by five, that's what you're dealing with. People who, you know, and this is why Pablo Escobar is somebody, I mean, it's there's been obviously documentaries, movies, but there's been studies on him. We did psychological studies on him. But, I mean, I don't know. I just hope one of those traffickers, we never get to see something, you know, see uh, someone like the likes of Pablo Escobar again, but uh, it's that uh, feeling, how do you fight a Sicario? You know, and the point I was trying to make in the beginning is uh, how do these people, you know, they're, they're brainwashed, they're start, they start them off early, and you know where Pablo Escobar used to recruit most of his Sicarios? Favelas? A place called La Terraza, the terrace, right? But we would hear they're meeting at La Terraza. We never knew what the code La Terraza, the terrace was. You know what it was? I just found out not too after Pablo no. Escobar got killed. La Terraza was one of the poorest Catholic churches in the poorest neighborhoods in Medellin. So the word would spread. Wow. Pablo Escobar would come in and, man, all these young kids, thugs, all waiting for him. And, you know, Pablo Escobar was very charismatic. 
you know, he'd hug them, kiss them. He had bags of money to give out. And that's how they would recruit. All right, you're going to work. All right, report to this house tomorrow. And everybody wanted to work for Pablo Escobar. So he had to turn people down, you know, uh, and that's that. Those were the orders. Say, hey, you know what? Kill and you know, Pablo Escobar uh, gives you an order. You're going to do it. And that's that was that life of a Sicario. And, you know, a lot of Sicarios died in uh, uh, gun battles. They died by other crooks. I mean, uh, there's not many of them left right now. It's crazy to think that that's what you're fighting against because that seems really, I mean, after that conversation, there would be very little hope, in my opinion, if I was there, if, you know, the normal person's there to continue. Yes. And, and you know what? We wanted to give up a lot of times. Just, you know what? Let him surrender. But then, like I said, I would see my friends get killed, you know, at the search warrants or the, the bombs. To me, the most scariest, deadliest uh, was the the car bombs, because you never knew where he was going to place them. Uh, so you'd be at the wrong place at the wrong time. I remember being leaving the base, our police uh, base, you know, convoy. There'd be a car bomb on the side of the road. Uh, I've experienced that. I experienced, uh, you know, eating. At like a, you would see it in, in, in person or you would see the aftermath? Yeah, you would see the af aftermath. Well, yeah, right. It, it, there was one at a park. And it was always where people were gathered that, you know, and Pablo Escobar wanted to kill as many people as possible. And, you know, that to me, you know, because that the noise of a bomb is very unique. It's sort of a muffled sound, if I can say that, a muffled type sound, very unique. You know, when it's going to be a, a, a bomb and then, you know, once you see that black smoke rising, and then, like I said, the aftermath is the famous, iconic photos of lifeless bodies of kids, women. Dismembered. Uh, it, 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 yeah, it is something that I hope I never see again. Uh, but he was placing them at shopping malls. He put one at a bookstore where kids and their parents were getting their supplies. Uh, he, he was placing them at public places. So that, to me, was the worst terrorism, you know, that we had ever seen because you did not know uh, in the innocent people that got killed, not knowing being at the wrong place at the wrong time. That to me was always, you know, that's it, terrifying. It always, yeah. yeah. I always would say like, why? Pablo Escobar, what, what, what does this innocent people have to do with your war? You know, uh, it, it was just, uh, it was just his, his message and his way of negotiating with the government of Colombia. And when I mentioned that negotiating, he knew what he was doing. That way, in uh, 1991, when he told the government of Colombia, I want to surrender and I'll stop my bombing campaign. So what do you think the government of Colombia did? Sir? Admit wow. defeat. That's great <laughs> yeah. news. Thank you. But then he says... Okay, I got my conditions, and here are my conditions. I'm going to surrender into my own prison that I will build, and I'll pay for it. Columbia, don't worry about it. I'm going to hire my own prison guards. I'll pay their salaries. Columbia, don't worry about it. I'm going to take my Sicarios with me. That way they protect me, and nobody can come and visit me. You know what that means, right? Nobody can come and visit. There's be no government official over In their own country. <laughs> yep, yep. So... Government Colombia basically was just at, I don't know how to say it, at wit's end. They just wanted the violence to go away. and they That's his own country in a sense, right? That's his own country, that prison. What's that? I'm sorry? That's his own country in a sense. It's yeah, a no, place no, that no, the government can't yeah. touch. That's literally his yeah, own country. Yeah, that's why I tell people the government is cannot come and visit. There's no official oversight. So basically I tell people, you know, we, Pablo Escobar won, and, and we had lost. But also, look at the other side of the coin. If you're the president of Colombia, and you got to make that decision, people are fed up with Pablo Escobar. They're tired. They're tired of getting killed. They're innocent. Uh, and you talk to anybody in Colombia who grew up during this uh, this time frame, and everybody's going to know something that happened to someone, you know. Uh, and, and it was just the violence 
was out of, out of control, the, the car bombs. And I, I don't know what, the car bombs has always been the, the main thing that Pablo Escobar uh, was, uh, you know, basically conveying to the Colombia. If you don't know what I do, I'm killing as many innocent people. So the government was tired. So when Pablo Escobar says, I'm going to stop my bombing campaign, it was like the, that was a victory for them. So obviously we did not like that decision, but can you blame the government for doing that? No, I, I don't, you know, and this is why, you know, and then, uh, uh, like you said, I, I watched his, uh, I was in Medellin, and I was called by our ambassador in Bogota. I said, Javier, you need to come back to Bogota. You know, the government didn't want any law enforcement presence at the surrender. It was covered by the press, Pablo Escobar. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, guess who the first two persons who get on the chopper to take him to his so-called prison was Pablo Escobar and Catholic priest, Father Rafael Garcia Riveros, a Catholic priest. And... Uh, I, I saw this mark with that because the the Catholic Church was saying that Pablo Escobar was basically a good person, and uh, why were they saying this? Paying so off all the money, all yeah. the money. <laughs> Pablo Escobar was uh, yeah, wow. Going to the Catholic Church anyway, so they using the church to recruit and then using the word of God to preach his yeah, own innocence. The word That's of God, crazy. Yeah. And, and you know what? And if you look at photos of Pablo Escobar's bedroom at, at his so-called prison. And, the, you know, I sometimes I just Google and I'll see the photo. It's the photo. It's a ceramic photo. I don't know how much it costs to make, but ceramic of the Virgin Mary over his bed. Can you believe that? The Virgin Mary over his Something bed. Something satire there's almost. A, there's, a, there's sort of a funny story because, uh, you know, uh, People will say, or or Steve, my partner, will tell people, yep, Javier slept in Pablo Escobar's bed, and everybody starts, you know, they think it's a, you know, but it is true, because I, I slept one night in his bed, because they the police uh, bet me that I would not do it. I say, yeah, I'll do it, you know. But you Wait, know, wait, you were I, there actually for a full night? Or, like, you could have yeah, stayed anywhere else? Night, I, obviously, I changed the sheets, but I, I could <laughs> not sleep. And it was like, of all the people that he killed, He's, he has a photo, I mean, ceramic tile image of the Virgin Mary. I mean, praying to the Virgin Mary and killing women, children. He didn't care who, who gets killed. Uh, so was there, an, that, was there a weird aura in that bed? Like, I know, like, ghosts and all that stuff, maybe people believe or don't believe, but is there actually, did you feel a different thing when you were in the bed? I don't know how to explain yeah, this. No, I felt, yeah, there's something. I mean, it, obviously, like I said, I, I couldn't sleep, but. The photo, and you know, and I'm, I'm Catholic, you know, uh, I believe in the Virgin Mary, and you know, I, it was just you know, praying to the Virgin Mary. Wow, and so you, yeah, you're gonna kill kids, uh, families, you know, and, and I don't know, that to be and still try to preach God, you're right? A, a right. Qu question yeah. for you in the prison here's the question that I, I'm cur very curious about in the show, it says that there was because he was in there for what about a year. Uh, yeah, to one it? year. It, it was one, one year. year. His sentence, yeah, and if I can just mention. Yeah, yeah. They, they came up with, they negotiated, all right, Pablo, hey, we need you to serve some time. So he knew what was doing. And they said, all right, five years. The original sentence was five years, right, for killing thousands of innocent people, moving thousands of kilos of dope. But Pablo Escobar knew he was going to be out in two or three years. You know, that's, it was just a ploy so that people could see that he served justice. Right. Stop paying attention to me. Yeah. I'll be yeah. out soon. I'll do, I'll do my time. So one year, he's in his so-called prison. And, you know, like you know, we'll talk here about the prison, but it was, a, it was no prison. It was a country club. It was a resort area inside. There were no bars. He had a drinking bar where people could go, you know, I mean, where he had alcohol. <laughs> different kind of bar. Yeah, different type of bar. But uh, so. Is it true that you couldn't intercept anything inside? Because that's what's said yeah. in the show, I believe. But you couldn't have right, right. any he access to information. Right. He was using uh, carrier pigeons. But then also, yeah, there was no electronic interception. He was using carrier pigeons. But also, he, he 
he had people coming in to visit him, so he was communicating with, hey, you know, person to person. So why? So do you, you don't even need to you know, risk a, phone, uh, a line, right? Yeah. Right. Nah, nah, so nah, did he actually know. buy a place next to the prison, or is that a, I can't remember if that yeah. was a myth or from the documentary? No, no, no. It's yeah, the prison. Yeah, it's and if you see the the pictures, it's like a oh, couple. I don't know. It's like a building, but on the side, he had bought all that land in. And how we missed it, I and we missed it. He was building chalets right on the site of the. If you can picture the structure, it's a. It was a big structure, uh, you know, cement building. Obviously, Pablo had his own apartment inside. You know, kitchen, living room, bedroom. Then the inmates had bedrooms, and on the back of the prison was a uh, soccer field. You know, because he loved soccer. Columbia soccer team would come in and play with him. And on the side, right on the side, there was like a mountain. And how they managed to build, they called them chalets. That's what the, the Sicarios call them. But there were like apartments on the side, beautiful apartments, you know, and parties. And, uh, I mean, it was just, you know, and none, nobody ever discovered that. No one until we got to the prison. That we, right on the side, he had apartments, and he had about like 10. in in the mountains, or in like mountains. yes, dug into out the actual. Mountain. Oh, sticking out. Okay, beautiful. I got yeah, you. I mean, covered wow. in camouflage. Uh, you know, like rustic. luxury apartments. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it was very. They're beautiful. A lot of foliage, a lot of greenery, a lot of flowers. The wood. I mean, this were like. I said, how did they build this? And my question is, how did they move all these refrigerators, stoves? Right. In how did how did no one notice? Right. Like, I, I, no one noticed. That's a massive yeah. project. Well, and, and also, he, you know, in his rule of, in Colombia, Colombia accepted that deal. We said no one's going to visit me. And the orders, the the, the rules in Colombia was guys, not even the U.S. government. I don't want anybody to screw this up. No one's going to, you know what I'm saying, go nearby, no overflights. There was, you know, there was, you know, a policy from the government of Colombia not to do anything. So we all missed it. And, when the uh, government, oh, sorry to interrupt you, when the government, uh, this is because this is a big kind of talking point and also a big talking point in the show. There is a lot of bureaucracy, obviously, in any government, in any agency. But it's very clear that when someone, let's say, above you has gives you a direct order, there is no going against that, right? Was there a lot of that going on where you're like, I want to do this, we want to do this, but then you just get someone a bit higher than you and they're like, don't do anything yeah. and you're and, stuck and there. Very, yes, that's a good point. It's very authoritative in their judgment and their rules. If you ever see, and you know what, I admire that, the respect, you know, the they, they click their boots when they salute. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's yeah. a respect, very professional. So when the orders come down, yeah, you don't, question it you don't you know obviously this is what they want to do but but when we were going after Pablo Escobar you know uh, there was a lot of liberties uh, I don't know how to tell you the, the liberties were you know uh, telephone intercepts you know that's sacred right that's fourth amendment in the United States to go up on a phone you need to write uh, the affidavits has to be like I don't know thousand pages, you know, uh, uh, wow. you, have, yeah. you need a lot of proof, you know, anybody thinks you can get up on a phone. Uh, that's a, that's a lie. <laughs> Believe me. The, the telephone intercept is a method of last resort. In other words, you go after a trafficker, talk about the United States and the only other method guys we've tried undercover informants, surveillances, so you got to go before a judge, and like I said, you got to write a lot, and you have to have a lot of proof. And you know, I mean, it's is that still true today, more, or is that changed? No, it's still it's more so stringent. True, yeah. Today. More, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's why I, I get a kick. Uh, it's like in the movies. Oh, well, just get up on the phone. <laughs> it's not that. <laughs> All right. If and it was it, that easy, it wouldn't very, have taken that long. Yeah, very difficult. Well, in the liberties we had in Colombia, we didn't have that. You know what? I tell people we'd pay the phone guy twenty bucks and we'd be up on a phone. <laughs> that was our intercept process. Hey, buddy, no buddy, way! You know, That's awesome. Yeah, that that is true. But you know, uh, so uh, that that was easy. But uh, like I said, it it's uh, there's certain you know differences. Uh, but 
I don't know. Yeah, in the movies, it's very authoritative. In, I mean, yeah, in real life. But the bureaucracy was basically, I don't know, the government was, we had a lot of freedom. We could do a lot of things going after him. And you know what? The orders, the search block, their only mission was to go after Pablo Escobar and the organization. Nobody else. Hey, there's, you know what I'm saying? That's the only thing, and which I like that because it, it it, it, you're, you're focused. And you know what we did also in the United States and in Europe? We concentrated on people working for Pablo Escobar. In other words, if you're in Miami uh, and this, this organization working for Pablo Escobar, the orders were drop everything and go after Escobar's people in Miami. So that's the first time that this the law enforcement strategy that we used was wiping out an organization, not just going after one person, wiping out all of the organization. And not when, when I talk about the organization, it's you know the money launderers, the the, the people that are most the infrastructure. The yeah, the infrastructure. So this is the first time, and it was working. I mean, it was we would do simultaneous takes out in Miami, Colombia, and Pablo Escobar was getting hurt, you know. And then uh, we started going after his money, and we were seizing a lot of cash uh, in Colombia belonging to Pablo Escobar. So uh, that we had more liberty with that. And then I remember the other thing that was a huge success was Escobar's uh, money laundering houses in Medellin, because we'd get all the records, we'd get all the accounts. And the government of Colombia would give us two days, that's a guy's, you got two days to copy everything you can. So we would have, yeah, that was generous. We, yeah, that's very it, generous. We would, uh, two days, we would have Xerox parties. In other words, we'd bring in all the people from the embassy, people, you know, and we'd rent Xerox machines. I don't know, we had about 20, so copy everything, then we'd send them. Yeah, so that, that was working. Uh, so those were the liberties. Uh, Did you had. also help? So I interrupt you. Did you also have help from? Because um, that's I don't know if that like I've watched a lot of documentaries and I've watched the show, so it's my perception of reality is a little bit distorted, unfortunately. Did, was there actual help from other cartels? There's, um, yeah. you know, the Cali yeah. cartel, yeah. the Don Gilberto. Yeah. There's. Yeah, you're right on it, and uh, let me you know let me try to explain how that happened because that's also unique. And you know what? Uh, we never get to ask that question like you asked it. We get the Don Berna, and I can explain that. But Cali Cartel and Pablo, and you have to realize, if you go back 10 years, they hated each other. And it was a fight to the death. I mean, they hated each other. And you know what? It was all about turfs, turf war. Because Pablo's forte was Miami, right? I mean, he had... All of the Florida, South Florida, uh, control. Pablo Escobar had Mexico, had Central America. And he was trying to expand the market into New York. And New York had always been Cali cartel control. So that's, you know, that's how the, that fight started. And Pablo Escobar knew the Orwell brothers, vice versa. And, I mean, it, it, it got to the point where Cali Cartel, Cali Cartel or, or Willow Brothers, put a car bomb at a building in Medellin called the Monaco Building. And the Monaco Building was when Pablo Escobar started, that's where he was living. A lot of people did not realize that it was an eight-story uh, penthouse building, and Pablo Escobar had the eight stories to himself. It was his building. Wow. Yeah. And they put a car bomb trying to kill Escobar's family. And everybody survived. Well, everybody survived. However, Pablo Escobar's little girl, his daughter, I think she's five at the time, gets hurt in the head, the bomb, and she's pretty much still deaf in one ear. I mean, she almost died. So can you imagine Pablo Escobar's hatred towards the Cali cartel? They tried to kill his little girl, his daughter, his pride, and he loved, he loved his kids. So he retaliated, and that, it was a big soccer match in Cali. Pablo Sensi Carlos, they killed a lot of them. I mean, and, and Cali Cartel even hired, they were uh, British mercenaries. 
And there's documentaries yes. on it. Where yes. They, this they, is they, uh, they the other line of questioning I wanted to get into. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Try to go after Pablo Bar, but the, one of the choppers crashed. Operation Phoenix. Yeah, that's it. Wow, you're good. Yep. And uh, they, but it went to the point where Cali Cartel brings in professional British mercenaries. So it's movie stuff. And you know what? It's, you can't make it up, man. How do you, you know, but it's, uh, the hatred was there between both cartels. So, when we were going after Pablo Escobar, what was Cali Cartel doing? They were learning. They were getting bigger and bigger because they were being left untouched, right? Sure, sure. So they, they learned from Pablo Escobar what not to do. Pablo Escobar was wild, wild west. Cali Cartel was business-oriented. Low profile. Pablo Escobar was high profile. In his early days, he'd come in to the restaurant, close the bar, the restaurant, hey, nobody in, nobody out. He'd pay everybody their meals and party with them. You know, when he'd drive up, he had a convoy, you know, 10, 15 cars with him. Cali Partel started driving taxi cabs, started low profile, so they learned. And, and That's yeah. that whole third season, right? You're, you're, how, how accurate is that? Are you still there trying to now work on the Cali Cartel side of this? One more time. Are, are you on the, in the third season? You're going after the Cali cartel, and that's a that's a different story. And I noticed you don't you guys don't get asked that as much in interviews, which to no, me is a no, real shame. We don't. Yeah, we don't. And basically, my second role because after I leave Colombia in 1994, then I get promoted to the number two guy in charge, and I go back in '99. So I'm involved in the Cali cartel, but more as a boss. You know what I'm saying? I got gotcha. you. Not, not hands-on. In the movie, they put me that I'm hands-on. I'm, I'm being more directive from the embassy, directing our troops, directing our, our – yeah. So that's that fallacy, right? But I was not hands-on. I was at the top but giving orders, basically. Were so, they actually going to surrender? Was that yeah. the actual yeah. plot Calico of the Hill, real life? Yeah, real life. They were going to surrender, cause, and they were going to do the same thing – same deal as Pablo Escobar. We'll do a couple of years, and then uh, we'll, uh, you know, we'll get out. However, they it it started getting violent, and uh, there's a famous. Uh, he's a general now retired in Colombia, General uh, Rosso Serrano, another hero, and he went after them before they could they could surrender it, it, because they were getting violent. And, you know, they, they were captured and then extradited to the United States. I understand one of the brother, brothers, uh, uh, Rodriguez Orwella, I think it was Gilberto recently died in prison in the United States. So they wanted to do the same plan as Pablo Escobar, but then they had a lot of jealousy in the Cali cartel. Some wanted to take the deal, others didn't, and it, they could never... You know, well, uh, how do you get four guys that are the biggest narcos on the planet to agree on surrendering? That seems right. like an impossible exactly. task. Exactly, and that's what happened. They had a lot of money, a lot of power. Cali Cartel was big into the telephone uh, intercepts. So there's, and I believe that there's, uh, they had a lot of Cali people would come in. They could listen to anyone uh, they wanted to listen. You know, so they had infiltrated their own. Uh, their, the telephone company and had engineers working for them were telling them what was going on. So that, that was very unique. But get, getting back to, yeah, just let mm -hmm. me, let me, uh, with, no, please. Uh, with, yeah, yeah, with, and Cali. So Cali there, all right, after, okay, let me see. Well, it'll, it'll make sense. When Pablo Escobar escapes from his so called prison, right? When he, the information that we receive is that Pablo Escobar had killed two of his famous lieutenants, a guy named uh, Moncada and another guy named Galliano, last names, Moncada and Galliano. They were called up to the prison to see the boss. Pablo Escobar thought they were stealing, not stealing, holding out money that was Pablo Escobar's. What happened one night, a couple of Sicarios get, find a bag of money. The, the money had not been buried properly. It was, it was deteriorated. You know, when cash, you try to hide it under the ground. And if it's not properly packaged, it's 
it's not going to last. You Never know, had this problem, to, unfortunately, but I do understand. <laughs> yeah, me too. Yeah, me too. <laughs> so Sicarios come up with this money, and it's deteriorated. And it was about $10 million. So they take it back, and they sort of egg on Pablo Escobar. Say, hey, boss, we found this money from your uh, lieutenant's house. The guys that you trust, uh, Moncada Galliano. Look what they've been holding out on you, boss. You could have been using this cash. So Pablo goes, he is pissed. He goes ballistic. So uh, he calls. He says, all right, tell him to come into the prison. But he made a very wise decision. But Pablo Escobar, very smart. He says, tell him, I just, it's a friendly meeting. In other words, I just want to talk about what new restaurants, bars are in town, who, what, what ladies are asking about me. We're going to have a couple of beers. You know, put, we'll throw some steaks on the grill. Just, But, yeah, I don't want the security coming in because it's going to be a lot of – it's going to be a big mess. So just that. So they come in, and it's Moncada. And I was told by one of our informants who was inside. And it's basically Moncada sees the money, and he knows – oh, uh, he knows. And Pablo is pissed. Pablo's not saying nothing. He's just looking at the money, and it's Moncada. Boss, boss, tries to calm him down. It's not what you think. We haven't been holding out on you. You know, I buried this money about 10 years ago, and we forgot all about it. And I believe that story. I really do believe it. They were not holding out. How do you hold out money on your boss? You know, and why and do you let it deteriorate out? to being useless? Right. <laughs> exactly, where Pablo could have used it. But And they were childhood friends to top it off. They were, you know, and they were doing all the loads for Pablo, you know, coordinating all the shipments. So Pablo gets so mad that he kills himself. To start, he's got a stick ready there and starts hitting this guy. As the cars come in, they kill Moncada, the other Sicaros come in, they kill Galliano. So that's when that information is now taken to the government of Colombia says, hey, you got a madman, look what he has just done. And plus, he's starting to kill Galliano family members. The orders were to wipe out the Gallanos and, and Moncada in Medellin. Still ranches, still businesses, and there's big or so. There's a bloodbath going on in Medellin, people getting killed. So that's when the government says, all right, we're going to transfer him to a real prison in Bogota. So that's the night of the famous escape when the Colombian, and he sends the military, he did not send the police. He sent about 20 Colombian military guys, and uh, there's a firefight between Pablo's guards and the Colombian military. Pablo, while the firefight's going on, Escobar and his sicarios walk out of that prison that night. And that's when we arrived. Steve and I arrived the very next day. That's when you arrived, take a nap. <laughs> and then we go to the prison and we say, the prison, hey, yeah. no prison. This is, he called it the cathedral. It was a country club. I mean, it was, there was no bars. Like you said, he had an alcohol bar there. Um, but it was, you know. <clears throat> I, uh, for I've women, been told the, the details already. By yeah. Steve, actually, <laughs> funny enough. Yeah, 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 but anything you wanted, expensive paintings. It was it, it, that's why we call it the country club. Uh, he was living in. So that's when the second search starts. Or Steve and I move into our uh, police uh, bloque de búsqueda in Medellín, and we live with the police for eighteen months until finally Pablo Escobar gets killed in uh, December nineteen ninety three. What this part of the story, this is why it's kind of fascinating that I, I feel like you guys don't get asked about the Cali cartel and there's so much interesting stuff to go over there. You briefly mentioned uh, Operation Phoenix, which to me, I mean, I, I'm not a conspiracy theorist any by any stretch, but to have a British team come in to kill this guy and then their plane fails because of fog yeah. or something like that and they land in the forest and like everyone except the pilot survives. I, I mean, just saying that out loud. Just saying that a lot sounds funny. No, that, that you are right. I mean, I think, how do you get all that military people, military equipment, planes? I mean, they had high-powered ammunition, high-powered rifles, everything, sophisticated. Right. And I'm not, you, I mean, I, and I wasn't there. You know, I wasn't sure, same. There, but I think they were helped by the certain members of the Colombian uh, government, of course. You know, you had to you had to have people that were on the take, uh, people 
that were, I mean, how do you get choppers? How do you get the British, you know, right. and they were training? So, right. These are the most expensive I, hired assassins on the planet, yes. or was some of them, I assume. That's what they're portrayed yes, as, in, right? Professional. They were good. We've talked to people who were, I mean, part, I, anyway, Just I'll just say that I've talked to people, and it was very expensive operation. They trained, you know, the, chopper, uh, the, the helicopters, planning the mission. And I think they even had some Colombian military people helping them, right? Right, um, right. That's yeah. So obviously, yes, I think government Colombia was knew about it. They helped out. Uh, some people got paid uh, to facilitate uh, that. You know, it was going to be a killing operation of Pablo Escobar, and and we you know what I've seen and I've read and I you know talked to people. You had this British mercenaries who were some of the best in the world. You know, and you know when we talk about. British mercenaries. I just, you know, what just came to my mind mm -hmm. is at the at the at the beginning, Pablo Escobar, sicarios, and, and the guy who never also gets credit is, is a guy named Jose Gonzalo Rodriguez Gacha, a Mexicano. He was Escobar's first partner. He gets killed in 1989, but he was richer than Pablo Escobar. They were both cartel uh, members, both leaders, but Gacha brought in Israeli mercenaries. And that one I know for a fact. The Israeli right. first used to have classes, right? You know, in the jungles, right, Net, close to Medellin, and you know, they'd get up at six to exercise. There'd be about ten instructors, because later on, we developed an informant who was part of that class who came on to help us, and we gained a lot of information on what had happened. But it was like ten, twelve, you know. Uh, Israeli mercenaries, you know, and Israeli mercenaries, they were the best at the time. So everybody, Cali Cartel had British mercenaries, Pablo Escobar had the uh, Israeli mercenaries. I mean, they, you know what, they're smart because they're using expertise, you know. And also, now that I'm thinking back, is Pablo Escobar's car bombs, you know, that has never really been uh, explained. You know, where they learned the basic... Uh, Manufacturer or how to put a how to place the the bomb inside the car. It was from the uh, Spain, the terrorist group ETA. ETA. Oh, yeah. interesting. Yeah, were, yeah, yeah they, that they makes made, sense. Uh, yeah, wow, yeah, we had a lot of proof that at the beginning. Then they learned, and they didn't need their assistance. But you know, ETA was, was there helping Pablo Escobar how to put the bombs inside the car. So that's kind of unique. So that's what I'm fascinating. Trying to say is yeah. They relied on 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 expertise. They got the money. Why not use the best, right? Yeah, of course. Uh, we're approaching an hour. Uh, I had so much stuff to ask you, I but know, you know, know, it is what it is. There's always time for uh, more questions. I honestly want to thank you so much for your time. Let me, yeah, and let me just also uh, Los Pepes because that's personal. Because mm -hmm. in real please, life, please. I get, yeah, I get accused of being a member of Los Pepes, and you know what? It was publicized. There was an article written that Javier Peña was part of Los Pepes. Publicized by who? Colombian News? No, by Miami. Made the oh. U.S. And then okay. it made Colombia news. Oh, man. And wow. Anyway, I had a lot of, but, you know, what happened is Don Berna, who in the show shows us as more as sharing information, and he was actually the head of Los Pepes. Don Berna was always at our search block, not knowing who Don Berna was. And I remember asking Colonel Martinez, and Colonel Martinez says, I said, Colonel, I don't really. Trust this guy. Colonel Martinez says, I don't either. Javier, he has been assigned, authorized by the Colombia Attorney General to work with us. So, hey, that's not well, my informant. That's Colombia right. Attorney General, the highest, you know. Uh, it's like the U.S. Attorney General saying, hey, work with him, not knowing who he was. So, basically, after Pablo Escobar gets killed, we find out Los Pepes. And Los Pepes was made up of Cali Cartel. Cali Cartel funded Don Berna, one of our police officers, which I will not mention, he is dead now. So they went to the Cali Cartel because uh, when Pablo Escobar killed Moncada and Gallano, Moncada's wife, in real life, Dolly, Monc uh, Don Berna, and one of our officers goes to the Cali Cartel. Cali Cartel starts 
funding Los Pepes for all the bombs, killing people, wow. information. So Cali Cartel was very, very critical in that they were providing funding to Los Pepes. Don Berna, I mean, he's an acquaintance. Hey, he knew me, Javier. Hey, Don Berna, because we were, were together. Sometimes Don Berna used to go protect us because we had to go meet informants. And if the police were busy, it was Don Berna not knowing <laughs> Oh, wow. Don Berna was the head of Los Pepes. After Escobar gets killed a couple of years later, we find out that Don Berna was the actual head. We indicted him. You know what? He's in the United States serving 30 years. He knows me well. I know him well, but I never did anything with him. I never, you know. In fact, I, I publicized it. I uh, He gave me a watch. I think it was like $100,000 when Pablo Escobar gets killed. That Whoa. Party. Here, oh, yeah, here's a gift. <laughs> Guys, I can't take it. You know. yeah, so I was told by one of the police officers, like, yeah, you better take that gift. So anyway, <laughs> I, call, I call my boss in, in Colombia. I mean, in Bogota, our big, we write a report. I send the watch back to DEA. You yeah, know, the card, that sucks. I saw one of the big bosses wearing that watch. So there's no justice there. Man. But anyway, that's, <laughs> uh, that's Don Berna is serving uh, 30 years. Uh, and I, did, I was not involved with Los Pepe's killing and all that. There's the accusations. You know how that is. So, sure. Yeah. I'm clearing your no, name as many you know, places like, as you can. I also want to end it, but the, the real heroes were the Colombian National Police led by Colonel Hugo Martinez, General Octavio Vargas Silva. They never got the credit. It's They're the ones. I mean, and you know what? Like they said, you know. Javier, this is our own one of our only credits. We get accused of a lot of stuff. Don't take it. And I, I said, I will never. I saw it firsthand. Y'all were the heroes, not CIA, not you know, not DEA. And the other theory, Pablo Escobar did not commit suicide. Did not commit suicide. Yeah, that probably gets brought up a lot. Conspiracies that he, got. he he was killed. But it was a bloody. I mean, and and you know what? I just. It's uh, we calculated ten to fifteen thousand people killed by Pablo Escobar, and one of his sicarios, a guy named Popeye, uh, who was who's the last now? remaining sicario who's dead now, claims the number is closer. He said that's now fifty thousand people, and Popeye Crazy. claims that he himself killed three hundred. So, narco terrorism started by Pablo Escobar. Hope we never see. Trafficker, we've seen some in Mexico that have reached to that level. But, you know, in my, you know, why all the innocent people? That's, that's, you know, they didn't have nothing to do with Pablo Escobar. Pablo Escobar should never be glorified. He is not a hero like the people out there that, you know, think he's a hero. Guy's just a mass murderer who killed, you know, 50,000 people. And, uh, you know, uh, I heard him on the phone where they were t- telling his wife that he loved her. In the background, I hear a yell. He covers the phone and says, cover his mouth. They're torturing a guy while he's telling his wife how much he loves her. So that's right. probably. That's the kind of person he was. The, the, uh, one more final question. I, this is yes. the last one, I promise. Uh, a bit out of left field, but have you have you heard about the movie or documentary Operation Odessa? Uh, just give me. A, I've, I've heard. Yeah, of it, it's but- about these guys that were selling um, a Russian military helicopters to the Cali cartel from Miami. One of them was from Miami. One of them was from Cuba. Right. During yeah. your time at, in probably right. Colombia, right. I would say. And uh, yeah, yeah, because Cali cartel was very smart. Very uh, professional, and they believed in a lot of, you know, the electronics, the choppers. So I believe, yeah, I had heard about it, and, and it is true. Cali Cartel was very, very advanced as opposed to Pablo Escobar. That's why Escobar was wild, wild west, and these guys were businessmen. Would really recommend that documentary for you or to have someone from from there because they almost bought a submarine with a nuke on it. Um, yeah. And that's that like the. <laughs> I mean, I, I saw a home. A built, uh, they were building a submarine, a real submarine. Uh, the cartel was in Bogota, but not like to see on top of the water a real cylinder. Whoa, like 20 foot cylinder. They had Russian engineers working it, so I got people to see don't that. know those are like 20 million dollar things. These are not like yeah. this is not this even in the, in the same world as a helicopter, a, it's even more than that, right? Not a science project, <laughs> they were building a, their own submarine, so yes, they're capable of anything. So, Nelly, I want to thank you again for inviting me. I'm sure, you know, please. And uh, like I said, I just want your listeners, the heroes, Columbia National Police. And we wrote a book, you know, 
uh, man hunters. If y'all want to hear, listen to the real story, please, uh, you know, please order it. And uh, I got a copy right here. Yeah, let's see it. If, if for anyone that's listening, I'll leave links down below to everything, right. um, everything right. they talked about, their podcast, their book, their website, everything. Yeah, man Beautiful. hunter. Uh, I gave it a read. I, I got a copy from you. So thank you so much, guys. That was thank a great, you, it was a great book. All right. And thank you again for inviting me this morning. Or, I know you're in a different time. <laughs> yeah, I'm in Spain. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, um, hope you guys enjoyed that episode. I will see you in the next one. Thank you so much, Javier. Have a good thank one. You. We appreciate it. You too, buddy. Thank